Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Good morning. Um, I said it to first service. I will say it to you as well. Be patient with me. Um, I am. I have this plan to incrementally turn the circle so that my back is not to everyone all at once. Uh, but be patient with me as this is new. This is fun. It has already been pretty incredible to watch as the Lord has shown up this morning. It's hard to follow that because his presence in our lives is why we're here. He's with us out there, but we come here to be reminded that he's with us everywhere. And so we're so thankful as God's people to be together. And I want to start this morning. My name is Beth. If I have not had a chance to meet you yet, I'm part of the team here at Crossroads. It's an honor to have you here with us. And I want to start, October is our Ministry Partner Appreciation Month. We have so many people who partner to help make the story of Crossroads possible. And I just want to publicly, in front of the whole church body, thank them for what they do. We have all these different things we're planning throughout this month, but we couldn't do it without you. So thank you. The other thing that we want to celebrate as a church family today um, is that yesterday, a bunch of our staff piled in a car and we went and saw as JV got married. And we have a picture that we want to show. We are so excited for JV. If you've not met him, this is our youth director. Um, and he has been with us for the last few years. He is awesome. Our kids really enjoy him. His wife, Michaela, is going to be moving here to join him in the ministry of the church. She is a PT, so she's going to be finding her feet in the valley. But we are so excited for them. And it was just fun to celebrate with our brothers and sisters. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. It was fun. So with that, we are going to dive in here at the very end. I want to start by recapping everything that we've done up to this point, but I'm not going to do it in as long as we did it before. I'm going to be very brief because here at the end, we have to not forget what got us to this point because this whole series of worship has been asking the question, what is worship? How do we worship? There are these deep questions for us as believers. If you are new to the faith, if you're walking this out for the first time, these are normal questions to ask. What does worship look like? And so we have to spend time unpacking that to see God's faithfulness in the midst of all of those questions. Because if you start with how do you worship, that's actually not the right place to start. But we do that in our humanness. We want to know how to do things so that we know we can be good at it. But God so often has something underneath that he wants to teach us. And so this sermon series has been asking those questions. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. We started with the who. The, the who we worship is a God who is holy other. He is good. He is faithful. He is beyond our comprehension, and yet in his goodness and in his faithfulness, he has chosen to make parts of himself relatable to us. And he's done that through the work of Jesus, through his attributes that we can relate to, his love, his faithfulness, his goodness. But we have to start with who? That the church cannot forget its foundational roots to worship the one true God, to not be wavered by the world that we live in that searches for its own truth, that we have to start by knowing who we serve, who loved us, who died for us. And then we ask the question, what? What is worship? And we took a look at scripture, we stepped back and we zoomed out and we saw these themes, these pictures that worship doesn't have just one simple definition, but worship really paints a picture of four things that we're invited into. We are invited literally to posture ourselves. That's the number one most used word for worship in all of scripture, to literally fall on our knees before the Father, to recognize that we're standing on holy ground that that's an internal and an external thing that we get to do. And then scripture painted the picture for us that worship is to give, to offer, to bring what we have to the God who's given us everything anyway, and to give back to him who is faithful and good. Then we see scripture paint the picture of worship as avad, to work. 
that before sin ever entered the picture, Adam and Eve were given in the garden a mandate and a task to be in the creative process, to work, to cultivate, that we are given a gift when we avad, when we worship through work, whatever that looks like. And then the fourth picture is to sing, to proclaim, to outcry. And yet so often that's the first one we go to, that worship is to sing. And yet scripture shows us that's the fourth used word for worship. We're invited into that, but it's more than that. That's the what. And then we asked where, where do we worship? And Jeff unpacked for us that the where, through the work of Jesus Christ, for you and for me, the where becomes us. We're the where. And then we talked about why. We worship God because he is holy and he is worthy. Because he meets us in the dark places. He doesn't give up on us. And because even though the world we live in is hard, we still serve a God who's in control. And then we talked about when. I love this picture. Jeff painted the picture of, of when do we worship? He used the phrase, every when. We are offered and given a gift to worship God in every moment of our lives. And then we got to the how. See, that's, again, the question we often ask first, but it's after unpacking all of that. Then we ask, how do we do this? And we took last week, and we're going to take this week, and we're going to end our series by talking about how we worship. And we started by talking that how is internal and external. Week one, we talked about the internal. It's an attitude. It's a posture. It's a spirit. And then today, we're going to talk about the fact that it's not only an attitude, it's also an act. It's not only a posture, it is a response. It's not only spirit, it is in truth. And that's how we are going to end our series today, that we are invited into acting. And I don't mean play acting. I don't mean pretending. I mean literally the act of worship to express what God is doing in our lives. We're invited into that, this Holy Spirit-enabled response. And I witnessed that this morning. I witnessed as this room was filled with voices lifted to heaven. You had a chance to hear what we get to hear when we're on stage. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a gift that's given by him in the first place. Psalms 45.1 says, My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My heart, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. My heart is stirred by a noble theme theme. The very ability that we have to worship him is a gift that he gave us in the first place, to worship and give back. I love this idea of giving back with no strings attached, with no agenda, with no plan. My son, he's not in here, is he? My my son, a few weeks ago, JV, our youth director, is, is great with kids, and he's developed a great friendship with my son, Sam. And a few weeks ago, he came and brought him some cards. There's this game that Sam really likes to play. And JV had a whole bunch from when he was a kid, so he brought them and gave them to Sam. And two, I kid you not, two weeks later, Sam comes up to JV and he goes, hey, you want to buy some cards? <laughs> they were the very thing that JV had just given him, my son turns around and is trying to make some money off of it. I love the honesty of a kid. Well, here's an opportunity. But when we think about that with worship, there should not be strings attached. We are invited to give back freely because he's given to us in the first place. That's what worship is. We are to worship in spirit and we are to worship in truth. Last week, we set the stage with a story that's found in the book of John. If you do not own a Bible, there are free Bibles all over this room in English and in Spanish. John chapter 4. I'm not going to read the whole thing as I read it last week, but let me just remind you of what the story is about. It's a story of a woman 
Jesus and the disciples are going to the Galilee from Jerusalem and they have to go through the area of Samaria, which we know from history, there's bad blood between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. The Samaritans had taken idol worship and they had mixed it with worship of the one true God. And so there was this animosity, this fighting. They were trying to figure out who, where we should worship God. Is it in Samaria? Is it in Jerusalem? There's all sorts of stuff. And Jews usually went miles and miles and miles around Samaria to get to the northern part of the Galilee. And John 4 tells us that Jesus had to go to Samaria. He had to. Why did he have to? He's God. He can do whatever he wants. He had to go there because he made a promise. Because in Samaria, in that land, there is an area where God met Abraham. And it was in that place that God made a promise to Abraham, a promise for land, a promise for family, and a promise for a redeemer. Jesus went to that place to say, I am that redeemer. I, I'm here because I made a promise. And here I am. He went to Samaria and there he encounters a woman and he puts himself in a place to need from her. She has to draw the water from the well. He has to receive it's in this posture of humility that Jesus tells her who he is. It's one of the few places in scripture where Jesus flat out says, I am the Messiah. And it's in this posture of humility that he begins to paint the picture for her of what worship really is. And those are the verses that I'm going to read today in John chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 21. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I am who speak to you. I am he. In this posture of humility to receive from her the water, he paints this picture of who he is and what it means to worship. We worship in spirit, in attitude, in humility, in our hearts. It starts there, but it doesn't end there. Oh, 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 how I wish sometimes it did. If you've known me for any length of time, you may know that I tend to be pretty emotional. I have lots of feels. And even though I may mask it at times, it's all there. It's all there underneath. And I would love the ability to worship God just in spirit, just internally, just with, with what's going on inside of me, with my emotions, with wherever I'm at. I would love to do that because that's easy for me. That comes naturally. What's more difficult is to understand that we are to worship in spirit and in truth, which means that my emotions do not get to dictate what it means to worship the Father. Our emotions inform, and then there's been a lots of research that's been done over the last handful of years that unpack the need for emotions. We need them, but we are not to be slave to them. They are to help unpack what's going on internally so that we can turn our attention to the Father. I cannot be driven to worship through my emotions, through my spirit, through what's going on, through what I'm feeling in the moment. Because if that's the case, then oh boy, am I in trouble. Because I will tell you how I feel moment to moment is very different. That what's going on in me internally is not consistent. It is not steady. And that comes in conflict with a God who is. And so I have to remember that we need both. That we are to worship in spirit and in truth. And I love what Jesus does here. 
because he says, I am the Messiah. Worship in spirit and in truth. What is truth? A few chapters later, in John chapter 8, we read of Jesus going to a festival in Jerusalem. It's there that we begin to see all this imagery play out of Jesus being the light of the world, of Jesus uh, being the way, the what? The truth and the life. What Jesus is saying to this woman is, I am the Messiah, worship in spirit and in truth. Worship in the reality of who I am and what I have done for you because I don't waver. I am consistent. I am God. To worship in truth means that no matter how I'm feeling, I am trusting and standing on the reality that my God is who he says he is. David says it, teach me oh, your ways, O oh Lord, so that I may walk in your truth. Jesus is truth. Jesus is what it means to have what's really real, to act upon the reality of what God is. That's what grounds us from making worship simply emotional prompts to how I'm feeling in the moment and catering to myself and what I want. We need both spirit and truth. I love this quote. It says, worshiping with a humble and pure heart is not enough. Worship in truth connects the heart or spirit of worship with the truth about God and his work in redemption as revealed in the person of Jesus Christ and the scriptures. With the songs that we sing here are picked intentionally. They're not picked just because they're fun, although they are fun. They're picked because they speak of the truth. That as we sing them, we are reminded of who God is and what he has done. And Jesus is linking this idea of worship with his very self. I love that. John chapter eight, like I referenced before, he says this. He says, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know truth and the truth will set you free. It is the truth that sets us free, period, friends. That's it. It's him. It's what he has done for us. It is his consistency, not anything I generate on my own. I have let myself down way too many times to continue to trust that I have this thing. He is truth. We bow down in worship so he can lift us up. We relinquish control to regain freedom in the presence of him who knows us best. So here's what I love. The second part of the how, how we're ending this whole series is how do we worship? Well, we come all the way back in a giant loop and circle back to the beginning, to the who, to who we worship, to the reality of his faithfulness. We start and we end in the same place by focusing on God through his gift that allows our attention to be turned back to him and his character. So how do we worship? We worship by allowing a, the spirit to prompt us to respond, to, to proclaim the truths of who he is and by being obedient and responding. Worship is literally and completely to the one. So there you go. The essential questions have been answered. We've circled back to where we started. And now the wonderful question is now what? We are taught as believers of the word to read scripture intentionally. Whenever we come to scripture, we always have to ask first, what does this passage say about the character of God? What does this say about who he is? 
And then we have to ask, what does this mean to the people who heard and experienced it for the first time? Because this story is intentional. It takes place where it does for a reason. What does this mean to those who experienced it first? Then we ask, what does this story mean for all of history? For every person who has claimed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what has this story meant to our heritage? And then we ask, finally, at the end, what does this mean for us? We get in a lot of trouble when we flip that. When we start by asking, what does this mean for me? What can I get out of this? That's where we get in trouble theologically. That's where the church can do a lot of damage. That's the last question we ask. And so we've done that. We've asked those questions in those prog that progressive order. So here we stand at the end. And now, guess what? We do get permission to ask that question because it does mean something for us. What does it mean for me to worship? What are the things that hold me back from experiencing God? And I think that before I can ask that of us, I have to be willing to ask it of myself because it is not fair or right to take people to a place that I'm unwilling to go to myself. So what does it mean for me to worship? What are the things that have hindered my ability to experience the Father? And for me, as I think about that question, there are two things that come to mind. There is something about worship. It stems back to a long story of my upbringing, my past, and my views of the Father. There is something about worship that feels so vulnerable. And that scares me sometimes. Because if in that vulnerability, I begin to think about myself, I am filled with such deep shame about what I'm not able to do. And so it becomes easier sometimes for me to go through the motions of worship than to deal with what's really going on underneath because I don't want to feel like God is shining a light on me. But he has to, because that's the only way to deal with what's going on underneath, is to shine a light on it, to bring it out of the darkness, to not allow the enemy to have a foothold on it. But vulnerability is hard. Authenticity is hard. One of the reasons we chose to do worship in the round this morning is so it can give a vis visual representation of how difficult it can feel sometimes to be vulnerable in worship. To see that people are looking and watching. That hangs me up. That gets in the way of what God is trying to do in my own heart. The other thing that gets in the way, if I can be really honest with you, I love, love, love what I get an opportunity to do. And sometimes I am so focused on whether or not you guys are experiencing worship that I forget we're actually worshiping. I'm so consumed with how are people responding? What are they doing? Is something happening? Are they, oh, 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 she sat down. Is she okay? I don't know if she's okay. Oh, is she standing? Oh, and I forget that it is not my responsibility to let you guys experience Jesus. It is my responsibility to be faithful to what he has asked us to do and to trust him with the rest. And so I have to get out of my own way. I have to step back and see that God actually has this thing. If 
to let go of my expectations and to come with a posture of expectancy that there is a group of people here who are faithfully walking out the call to love Jesus first and foremost, and I can trust what he is doing in their life. And I get the opportunity to stand back and watch. So here's the beauty of scripture. Here's the beauty of the story of the gospel. As I know what the Lord has called me to, and I know the vision that I have to hold on to. And the beauty is, is that scripture is pretty clear that we are to worship God independently within the posture of our own hearts. But over and over and over again, we see in scripture that we are called to worship as a community of believers. To know when we need to step back and to allow you guys to minister to each other. Because that is what is going to make this thing work. That is what is going to carry the message of the gospel forward that will invite others into this space, is the ability for you guys to lead one another in worship, not in fakeness, not in pretending, but in vulnerability and authenticity, encouraging and lifting one another up so that the gospel can be proclaimed and he can be glorified, period. That's why we're here. I love Hebrews 10. 10.23, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We need the encouragement the church provides for one another as we walk towards becoming more and more Christ-like. So why did we do worship in the round here at the end? To remind ourselves that if we are really going to make it in this thing, we need to do it together. That we are called to journey. I love this book. Well, books, uh, many, many books. I love Lord of the Rings. These are stories that I grew up on way before the movies came out, way before they became popular or Hollywood grabbed a hold of them. Um, and I loved what they represented when it meant to being a good friend and what it meant to sacrificing for something greater than yourself. But what, I, what really drew me to the story was the story behind the story. Because the author, Tolkien, really, really struggled to write this book. He was in love with Norse mythology, with the languages. He loved to write. He loved the story of the hobbits, but he constantly got in his own way. He would get afraid. He would begin to doubt himself. He would begin, he'd put the book down and walk away and think, I'm never going to be able to finish this thing. And what we don't know when we simply read the book is it was his best friend who pushed him to not give up who pushed him to say, what is that? What happens next? I want to hear the next chapter. Tell me more. Friends, the church needs each other. What happens next for you, for me, on this journey of faith? That's the adventure. That's something that the world can't take from us. That's why we worship, because we have a story and we have a God who is faithful and we have the story. Vulnerability, the ability to do it together. Our goal is not to generate something fake, but to posture ourselves to experience something authentic to look across the room on Sundays and midweek, to see people out in their homes and in their communities authentically leaning into him. Worship is something we are invited into. It's a way of life that we're committed to taking together, not a box to be checked on our spiritual to-do list for the week. It is a gift and an opportunity given, and it is an essential part of our response to a God who loves us and is for us. It is to be stewarded, explored, practiced, 
cultivated within our own hearts and within the context of this growing community. Worship is to the one. So let's continue to do that. There are lots of ways we worship. Again, that's been part of what we've communicated through this series, but we're going to go back to singing. Something really special happens when we lift our voices to the King. The worship team is going to come back up here. We are going to go back into a time of proclaiming the truths that we know. So as we go back into that time of singing, respond in authenticity and respond in intentionality. Stand, sit, raise your hands, fall to your knees, whatever prompts you to bow in spirit to the one who is truth. Does that sound good? Let's do it.